binds tightly. So you can take this brain slice, soak it in a solution of ketanserin, and then wash it off, put it on a photographic plate, and then see where the radioactivity stuck. And what you see is all these red areas, and this is the frontal cortex, and then in the rear part of the brain around the uh, visual occipital areas, those red areas are the expression, high expression density of serotonin 2A receptors. If you blow that up, the cortex is in a columnar form. So this would be the, I know it's working, but I just can't see it. This would be the outside of the brain out here. This would be the inside, looking from the inside out. These darker areas are cortical pyramidal cells. They're the major computational units in the cortex. And the serotonin 2A receptors, if you can see the blue arrows, they're, lo they're located <clears throat> on what are called the apical dendrites. The cell body is a triangular shaped area, and then just above it in the apical dendrite is where these serotonin 2A receptors are located. <clears throat> just to give you an idea of what the cortex looks like, it's a pretty amazing piece of electronic machinery, bioelectronic machinery. This is a schematic diagram, and these are the pyramidal cells. They have roughly a pyramidal shape. They project up to the outer layers of the cortex, and these are uh, labeled uh, areas L1 through uh, L6. <clears throat> and there are a lot of cells here. This actually is a slice from mouse somatosensory cortex. And what they've done here is take those pyramidal cells, and they've uh, had them expressing a green fluorescent protein, so you can see them. So the only thing you see here are the pyramidal cells, but all these other cells are in there. Just to show you the density, and this is a wiring diagram that's been used as a simulation for how that cortical function works. So the cortex is a pretty amazing thing, and it has these uh, processing units that are arranged in columns, and there are these oscillations that are going on all the time in these cortical units, and the cells work together and they get input from other areas of the brain, and we'll talk about that. So the cortex, with its serotonin 2A receptors, is a, an important site, and these serotonin 2A receptors are located on the pyramidal cells, and what they do is they reduce or depolarize the membranes of those cells so that they fire more easily. The net effect is that cortical pyramidal cells increase their gain, or they increase the signal noise ratio. So that is, they can pick up weaker signals and amplify them. <clears throat> just to remind you what a synapse looks like, this is just a typical synapse. So what we're talking about is the serotonin 2A receptors are located in the membranes of these cortical pyramidal cells. And then we have axons that come from various parts of the brain that release serotonin and they hit these receptors and they produce this activation in the cortical pyramidal cells here. <clears throat> so that's sort of what's going on outside. What happens when serotonin or psychedelic hits these receptors? What happens in the brain cell or in the cortical cells? Some basic terminology. These are called dose response curves and, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with these. These are dose response curves and what they represent is the effect of a drug as a function of how much of the drug is in the solution. So if we're measuring some, any effect here, we define some effect, functional effect, and we put serotonin in here, as we increase the dose, what you get is a, what's called a sigmoidal curve like this that reflects the effect of serotonin at various concentrations. And since serotonin is a normal endogenous transmitter, the full effect is defined as what serotonin can do. What serotonin produces over here is, by definition, the full effect, the 100% effect. If we put a drug in that blocks serotonin receptors, so it occludes it, so serotonin can get to the receptors, depending on how much we put in, it'll move that curve to the right. So now as the concentration goes up, it takes a larger concentration to produce the same effect. Then we have these things called partial agonists. You see, they activate the receptor, but no matter how much you put in, they don't get to this full 100% effect. Psychedelics are partial to full agonists. They usually lie in this range here. So some of them come very close to being as, a, as potent as serotonin. Others are much weaker. LSD is a weak partial agonist. So these are the kinds of things that you see with respect to the signaling in the cell after you put a psychedelic or a transmitter on. <clears throat> Inside the cell, we have second messenger or signaling pathways. So here's an example. Here's what it was thought for many years that serotonin 2A receptors did. And I'm not going to go into the structure receptors. That'll, I'll do that in the workshop on Monday for those of you that are going to be there. <clears throat> but what this is is a, a protein that's wound around in little helical segments 
that goes back and forth through the membrane, and that's a bundle of these helices packed together. And when the serotonin interacts, or the psychedelic interacts in the top here, in this bundle, it causes the receptor to change its shape. And these things down here are called G proteins. They dissociate, exchange GDP for GDP, and they activate various enzymes. In this case, this G alpha protein activates an enzyme called phospholipase C, which hydrolyzes parts of these membranes and produces two signaling molecules, inositol triphosphate, inositol phosphates, and diisoglycerol. And then these things carry on. Diisoglycerol activates a, a protein kinase C, and that changes the membrane potential. So these are called signaling molecules. So the receptor is just here to turn on these signaling molecules. So we have the chemical hits the receptor, the receptor changes its shape, that causes these to be released and activate the signaling molecules. This was a classical view of what serotonin 2A agonists did. <clears throat> well, they don't just do that. They also turn on the phospholipase A2 pathway. And they do it to a different degree depending on what the particular molecule or psychedelic is. So now we have at least two pathways. Well, things are getting a little more complex now. <clears throat> And that's relevant because if you actually look at the ability to activate those two pathways, you see that different molecules have different effects. So here's serotonin itself. In the phospholipase and the arachidonic acid assays, you see that serotonin, by definition, reaches the 100% response. And its ability to activate is almost identical for both of those pathways. Here's LSD. Here's the uh, phospholipase C activation, arachidonic acid activation. In neither case do we achieve the 100% that we got with serotonin. In fact, LSD is more potent in arachidonic acid release than in phospholipase C, achieving less than 50%. So it's a weak partial agonist in both of these pathways. Silicin, by contrast, both of those pathways reach the same maximum in contrast to LSD, but there's a slight difference in potency. <clears throat> and you see that arachidonic acid release is more potent. It takes less to do that than phospholipase C. Is everybody following this? Stop me if you're not. <clears throat> well, so why is this important? We want to know what are the signals in the cell that cause the psychedelic effect. Well, <clears throat> it becomes very complicated. This is a compound called 2CI. It's a psychedelic phenethylamine. And what you see is we have two curves here, one for arachidonic acid release and one for phospholipase C activation as a function of increasing concentrations of 2CI. <clears throat> We have the same thing for the Zen-benzyl compound and the same thing for the TCB2. And if we actually compare the ratios for turning on these two pathways, the ratio of the EC50 for turning on PI versus EC50 for arachidonic acid release, the ratio is 1.2 psychedelic, about 1 to 1, okay? <clears throat> TCB2, the ratio is closer to 6. And this compound is commercially available. It's sold as a selective uh, PLC activating serotonin 2A agonist, psychedelic. This compound, extremely potent, in between these two in terms of signaling, it's not psychedelic. Well, that isn't getting us anywhere. So, but these things are important because we don't understand what are the signals in the cells that cause the psychedelic effect. <clears throat> this is a table summarizing ratios for a number of compounds, but it's uh, easier to see it uh, just like this. So here's the PLC potency activation for a number of compounds, LSD, psychedelic, these two not psychedelic, uh, until we get to these over here, which are phenethylamines, 5-methoxy-DMT, and psilocin. You see the ability to activate the phospholipase C, pathway decreases, phospholipase A2, uh, PLA2 potency increases in the opposite direction. Well, we still don't know what's the signal. Psilocin is very potent in activating PLA2, signal, but LSD is more active in activating the PLC potency. So that doesn't get us very far. <clears throat> and the reason this is important to me as a researcher is because I keep asking the question, why is LSD so potent? Here's DOB, it's a phenethylamine, the dose is maybe one, two, three milligrams. LSD, the dose is, what, tenth of a milligram, two tenths of a milligram? And if you, if you look at these, though, the potency Affinity for the receptors is about identical, but the ability to activate the receptor for DOB is 80% here, 75% here, for LSD 22% and 56%. LSD is really a rather weak compound in terms of activating that receptor. 
And this is a puzzle that no one has been able to solve. Why is LSD so potent? <clears throat> well, it gets even more ugly. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I had a, a visiting scholar named Niels Jensen who went to do a postdoc in Brian Ross lab, and we sent him a bunch of compounds. This is a piece of it. It's unpublished data. They uh, told me I could uh, publish it. This is called a heat map. And that, what this represents is the strength of a signal. So that <clears throat> something that is very potent is over here in the white, something that's less potent is over here. It's almost like heat. Things that are hot would be glowing red and then white hot, right? These are eight different signaling pathways. <clears throat> here's that arachidonic acid release. Here's PLC activation, those two we just talked about. Here is DOI. Here is uh, 2 CB fly. This is TCB2. This is bromo dragonfly. This is bromofly, and this is that N-benzo compound, which is not psychedelic. All the rest of these are. And every one of these has a completely different signaling fingerprint. No one knows what the signaling fingerprint is that's necessary. And every one of these signals is transmitted by activation of the serotonin 2A receptor. If we put a drug in that blocks the serotonin 2A receptor, every one of these signals is blocked. So analyzing this is, this is right at, I mean, this paper is not even published yet. This is state of the art. What is the signal? that's involved in producing the psychedelic effect. <clears throat> so let's move out of that because if I go any farther, it's going to become even more difficult. How does a receptor signal change consciousness? Well, this is a question everybody would like to know. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you how I think it could do some of that. I have to watch my time. <clears throat> this is a schematic of the brain. <clears throat> And I'm going to show you all the places that serotonin 2A receptors are located. <clears throat> First of all, as I've just indicated, they're located on the apical dendrites of these pyramidal cells. And these are the major computational units in the cortex. And the cortex, especially the frontal cortex, is where we make sense of the world. This is where we make executive decisions. It's where sort of the gestalt, the everything, you know, our, our reality is put together. <clears throat> there are inner neurons that couple these together that are inhibitory that also have serotonin 2A receptors. The Rafe nucleus is a very ancient area at the top of the brain stem in the midbrain, and all the serotonin in the brain comes from these Rafe cells. The locus ceruleus is about in the same area of the brain. It's also evolutionary, very old, and all the norepinephrine in the brain comes from the locus ceruleus. And the ventral tegmental area is an area of dopamine cell bodies. There are two of them, the ventral tegmental area and the uh, substantia nigra, and they make all the dopamine that goes to the higher brain. So normally when the brain is functioning, all the information that we're getting, uh, except for olfaction, is coming in and being processed through the thalamus. And there are a number of nuclei. The thalamus is in the middle of the brain. All your sensory information is coming in and being processed through the thalamus, and the thalamus is deciding what's important. It's filtering it out and deciding what's important. And then it's sending it on, so ultimately it, it reaches the cortex. <clears throat> there aren't many serotonin 2A receptors in the thalamus, but in the paper that was published showing the uh, analysis of where these were located, one of the areas that they missed that I was interested in was this reticular nucleus. This is a thin sheaf of tissue that wraps around the thalamus. It sends inhibitory fibers into the thalamus. It gets its input from the thalamus. And it actually regulates what gets through the thalamus. And there's a lot of serotonin 2A receptors in, the, in this reticular nucleus, and nobody's actually studied that area. So this is sort of a, uh, a gate, if you will, on what gets through the thalamus. And the thalamus decides what gets through to the cortex. The Rafe cells fire at a rate that's course, that corresponds to your level of vigilance. So when you're awake and moving around, the Rafe cells have a regular firing rate. Tick, 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 tick. When you start getting drowsy, if my talk is dragging on, your Rafe cells start going tick, tick, tick. And for those of you that partied too late last night and you fall into REM sleep while you're in here, your Rafe cells stop firing altogether. <clears throat> Psychedelics cause Rafe cells to stop firing, like when you're in REM sleep. Well, that's very interesting because when they stop firing, they quit sending serotonin up here, and all the serotonin signals are shut down. The locus ceruleus is an interesting area. Uh, depending on who you believe, it has all kinds of roles, but one role for it is, it's been called the novelty detector. 
So the novelty 